Hi, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Avinka, and I'm the event director at the bookstore, and I'm so pleased today to be joined by Emmanuel Aduma, live from Lagos, and NYRB Classics editor Edwin Frank for a discussion of Cipri uh, Cipriani Equincy's masterpiece, People of the City. Uh, this program is part of our ongoing virtual event series with the NYRB Classics, and we're especially grateful for their partnership. Um, our organization stand united in solidarity with the ongoing protests against racism, police brutality, and white supremacy. And we're proud to be able to bring you programming that re-examines classics from all around the world in hopes of bringing our shared humanities together. Um, so to, to housekeeping for tonight, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of the screen um, where you can submit a question. You can start that you know, right now while I'm talking and at the end of the event, uh, I'll come back in and we'll try to get through as many of those as we can. Um, there's also a chat function here below uh, where importantly, I'll be posting a link to buy tonight's book um, as well as a link to donate directly to some uh, organizations involved in Black Lives Matter, bail and legal funds, if that's within your means. Um, so a caveat for tonight's event and all of our virtual events, um, we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads. So please bear with any technical issues that might arise during the program. We'll try to solve those really quickly. Um, and finally, we're adding more virtual programming every week. Um, on Thursday of this week, we'll have a discussion of Carlos Buscad's true crime novel, Magnetized, with translator Samuel Rudder and critic Gabe Habish. Uh, and next week, our NYRB Classics series continues with Edwin joined by translator Padma Biswanathan for a talk on Graciliano Ramos's novel, Sao Bernardo. Um, you can register for these programs through our website, uh, where you might also consider joining our newsletter, where you can stay up to date on um, more of our virtual programming as we add it through the summer and the fall. So now a little about tonight's uh, presenters, and we'll get started. Emmanuel is the author of A Stranger's Pose, a book of travel stories, which was long listed for the 2019 Ondaatje Prize and The Sound of Things to Come, a novel. Uh, his stories and essays have been published widely, including in The Millions, Lit Hub, Aperture, British Journal of Photography, Art in America, Guernica, and the New York Review of Books, naturally. Uh, he was awarded an arts writing grant from the Creative Capital Andy Warhol Foundation for his essays on Nigerian artists. Uh, in 2017, he was associate curator of the Nigerian Pavilion at the Venice Biennial. Uh, he teaches at the School of Visual Arts in New York and divides his time between Lagos and New York. And Edwin was born in Boulder, Colorado, and educated at Harvard, Harvard University and Columbia University. He is the author of Snake Train, Poems 1984 to 2013, and the editorial director of the NYRB Classic Series. So Emmanuel and Edwin, the stage is yours. Thank you, Hal. Thanks, Hal. Um, Thank you. Well, I think I'll start the way we usually start, by just um, uh, giving a bit of a rundown on the book. Um, Cipri de Quincy's People of the City, which Emmanuel has written a wonderful introduction for, uh, came out in 1954. Um, and here's the setup. There's this young man, Amuso Sango, who has moved from a rural part of, of Nigeria uh, called the Eastern Greens in the book um, to an unnamed city, but a city which is clearly a booming um, Lagos. And um, he's a man on the make. Um, he's out to make girls too, and he seems to be phenomenally attractive to girls, more attractive than he can practically handle. Um, he's, he, he has a band uh, which, and plays jazz, his favorite. Uh, he loves Louis Armstrong and Harry James, and he plays at the uh, wonderfully named All Languages Club, uh, club in, in, in the city. Um, He's also a reporter on a paper which um, called the, the West African Sensation, which does a, a brisk business in the most sensational news it possibly can, and which Amuso is good at, um, uh, good at, good at providing. But um, as the book starts, um, he, uh, he has um, his women, his, his <clears throat> women, the women problems are catching up with him. Uh, the book starts with the, the woman he spent the night with before showing up at his door with something mysterious in mind. Uh, meanwhile, he's also got a, a fiance back in the country and he's got a mother 
And though Musso's leading a kind of bohemian life, he also actually is really just sort of wants to make a, he's, he's a pretty conventional guy in a lot of ways. He wants to just sort of uh, put things together and, and lead a, a decent life and he wants to make money. So that's the way the book begins. It goes on, the tone is, um, this is a popular book. It's meant to be, it's a fun book. Uh, it's, the tone is rough and ready. Uh, the writing is rough and ready. The, to the, the plotting is melodramatic and the, and, uh, the, and the plotting is episodic um, and uh, coincidences build up almost like a traffic jam in the city. Everybody is always running into each other and you can hear the honk. It's, a, it's, a, it's in a way a novel where you can hear the horns honking all through to get out of my way, one person or another. And the novelist in some sense trying to sort of um, push his way through his novel to the end of it. Um, it is, um, it's interesting that the first part, everything seems to be going pretty well for Musso, but things take a turn to the worse uh, in the second, and then they get, things go down and down and down, and then a lot of people die, all of which it results in a happy ending. Um, and <laughs> yeah. so it's, it's, it's a strange sort of improvisation of a book, but um, uh, it's a book in which, in some sense, the possibility of, 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 uh, of a new literature for what was, not yet a new country on its own, still a country in colonialism, is being, is being hammered out. And um, now I'll turn it over to um, Emmanuel uh, to read something from it, and, and then we'll proceed to talk about it. Um, thank you. It's a, pleasure. it's a pleasure to do this and pleasure to, um, to talk about a quincy. Um, so I'll read, um, I think, from the somewhere in the middle of the book, um, page 69 or so. And it's, you know, it's this point in the book where he, that Songo or Amusa, um, is going to report on a story. Um, so I'll just read it and then we can talk later. Day by day, thousands of copies of the West African sensation rolled off the huge presses were quickly bundled into waiting green vans that immediately struck out north, east, west, covering the entire country from the central point of the city. In the last few months of, of, this, of his present tour, McMaster's policy of giving local writers free reign was beginning to pay off. The West African sensation was becoming a part of life, something eagerly awaited for its stories of politics, crime, sports, and entertainment. For Songo, life had settled down to a routine and he seemed to be looking for some excitement to brighten up his page. Sometimes he had to remind himself that however exciting crime was, it brought tragedy to someone. But it was his function to report it and to him, it had become something clinical with neither blood nor sentiment attached. Unexpectedly, his chance came one afternoon with a strange phone call. And it, was very near, and it very nearly altered his whole life. The caller had said that a body had been found floating on the lagoon. McMaster had instantly detailed Songo to cover the assignment. Songo found on his arrival at the beach that a huge crowd had, had gathered in the manner of the people of the city. The police vans blared at them through loudspeakers, urging them to keep clear and to, do, and to touch nothing. The shops and offices had emptied and there were clerks with pencils stuck to their ears, fashionable girls with baskets of shopping slung over their arms, ice cream hawkers pedaling bicycles, motorists tooting their horns. The coconut palms waved their lazy fronts over the body draped in white and lying on the sands. Songo went over and took a bold look at the face. It was the body of a man in the prime of life. And as it turned out later, he had taken his own life. His name, Songo discovered, was Braimo Ajikatu. He had been meeting, missing from home for about three days. He was a clerk in a big department store, and he was married with four children. They said he had been finding it dif increasingly difficult to support his family. To him, the city had been an enemy that raised the prices of its commodities without increasing his pay. Or even when the pay was increased, the increased prices immediately made things 
worse than before. Brian's plight was not alleviated by a nagging wife. He complained aloud, and a friend at the office who walked no harder but always enjoyed the good things of life said, have you not heard of the Ufemfer Society? He had not heard, and the friend told him about Lugat Square at midnight. There was to be a meeting. He went and was enrolled. They promised him all he wanted. And strangely enough, life became bearable. He could not understand why his salary was increased or why he was promoted to store's assistant, but it was not in his place to question. There was even a promise of becoming branch manager within one month. Why had it not happened all the time he was not an UFEMFA member? That too he could not answer. But he had been initiated and he now knew the secret sign of UFEMFA. This revealed to him that he had been the only non-member in the department store. One night the blow fell. This was the unexplained portion of the pact. They asked him in a matter-of-fact manner to give them his firstborn son. He protested, asked for an alternative sacrifice, and when they would not listen, threatened to leave the society. But they told him that he, would, he could not leave. There was a way in, but none out, except through death. He was terrified, but adamant. He had told no one of his plight, and that was when he vanished from home. Now that the good things of life were his, he would not go back and tell his wife. All this songo lent, and much more besides. For him, it had great significance. By uncovering this veil, he had discovered where all the depressed people of the city went for sustenance. They literally sold their souls to the devil. Even so, when things became much too unbearable for him, Songo often thought it would not be the worst thing in life to join the Ufemfe. And he would remember that swollen body with its protruding tongue and bulging eyes the body that had been rescued from the devil's hands and given a decent Christian burial. And yet the tragedy remained. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Well, it's a great passage and, and one which um, uh, brings up a lot of the elements of, of the, um, the different threads that uh, uh, Quincy is sort of uh, weaving together. Or, um, and, one is that notion that there was a way in, but not a way out, which mm -hmm. in this book, which is more about a city than it is about its main character, I would think in yeah. a way. Um, the life of the book is just, is the constantly shifting and sort of um, unpredictable life of the city, which is indeed full of death. I mean, as a, as a reporter, um, he, the main character is, is Sango is, is seeing that life. Um, all the time, but seeing that, seeing the precariousness of it, even as it's mm -hmm. seeing sort of the high life, because this is um, also sort of a period of high life music and things like that, I yeah. think too, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, it interests me, I, when I read it before, I thought of it as a kind of, first, a kind of um, loud, brash, cheery book, but there's a lot of anxiety in this book. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there certainly is a lot of anxiety. I mean, uh, the, the book is sort of set, you could say, between the late 40s and um, the early 50s. Well, or even earlier, because there is actually a clue that I found that it may have been set. Um, and this is where it gets a little com complicated and maybe um, asynchronous, um, because the, the Eastern Greens that he refers to and talks about this accident um, in, in the mines, um, there is a real incident that actually happened, I think, in the early 40s. The um, you know, the cult, yeah, yeah, where there was some kind of rioting and shooting. And so I think the book is, um, Equency is sort of trying to set it in, in between the 40s and the 50s, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the anxiety of those moments where, you know, was really um, a a nationalist or, you know, the anxiety of nationalism or self-independence as, you know, um, or self-rule as it was then called. Um, and so when, if that is the, the, the entry point into, um, say, the, the, the setting for the book, I think it reveals um, 
a kind of anxiety that is besides just merely the anxiety of the city itself. It's also the anxiety of a, of a nation trying to um, become independent. Uh -huh. um, and, um, and what's even more telling for me is that um, Equency does not um, choose to, uh, you know, as I write in the introduction, um, sort of enact this clash of modern, you know, modernity and, um, and tradition in, in a more, in an obvious way, like say, um, Chin Wachibe or um, even Shoinka in some of his plays, but to just diving into, you know, Noah and diving into the grit of the city or the, um, the city as a heel of wrongdoing, as he calls it. It's almost like this. Um, it, it seems to me like getting into the Nigeria of the 70s, actually, and 80s, when, when, when things have sort of um, um, culminated in, 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 in what is now some kind of existential angst of the, you know, in the Nigerian condition. So when, when I think about all of those, you know, um, all, of, all of those things, I see an anxiety that is, um, also an anxiety of a nation um, coming into itself, um, besides even the anxiety um, of being in a city as, as big as um, Lagos. But of course, he doesn't name the city, so we are yeah. just speculating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. sort of, it's funny that, that feelings sw swing back and forth uh, and, indeed, and crowds gather and, and feelings spread amongst crowds with extraordinary... Uh, fluidity in this book, so that yeah. you know, there's a funeral late in it where Sango goes and he says, yeah. he went, it's a wake actually, he went to the wake because he heard, because his best friend had told him there were all sorts of women to pick up at the wake. And then he meets a woman who says to him, hey, you know, you look great and is making eyes at him because uh, because Quincy's women are very forthright. And um, yeah. at which point Abusa says, what are you talking about? You know, hooking up at a funeral? That's a terrible idea. Um, and so, you know, yeah. the volatility of feelings and the uncertainty of yeah. feelings is just constantly being played out. And then everybody's always getting mm -hmm. pulled away from one thing and pulled away to another thing. It's, 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 mm -hmm. um, uh, it's fun. It's a little confusing sometimes, too. But that, uh, how did you come to the book in the first place? How did you come to a Quincy? Um, I, you know, I mean... I, uh, <laughs> I mean, so when, when, you, when you asked me to write about this, I thought, oh, this is funny because, you know, my, my first um, attempt at plagiarism was actually, um, <laughs> you, know, by, by, you know, by plagiarizing a Quincy. Um, when I was about 14 or so or 15, I, I, I just sort of stumbled on this book in a, in a library, I mean, in a, in a, family, in, in a family friend's house. Um, and I think the first 10 or so pages were torn out, right? So I basically started reading the book from, say, you know, um, you know, a dozen pages in. Um, and at that time, I had this, you know, grand ambition of writing a novel and sort of writing some kind of city novel. And I can't remember if I started a novel, you know, before finding this torn copy or if because I had read the Aquency book, I started writing the novel. I mean, um, and I would just sort of lift passages from, <laughs> from uh -huh. the Aquency book. And, and I had the story I was sort of telling, but the Aquency book became this like, um, you know, resource where I would go for like phrases and, um, and sentences that I, that I felt could work in my own book. And of course, there was no attribution whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so grateful that that manuscript is lost. I don't even have any idea of what the story was. But this is how I came to the book. I think by that time I had um, already known about the Quincy. I had read him as a kid. Um, he, he had, you know, he wrote a number of children books, um, including one called The Passport of Malam Ilia. Um, and um, I think something called African Night Entertainment, if I'm, if I'm correct. Maybe actually that wasn't by him, but The Passport of Malamedia for sure, he had written, I had read it as, as you know, maybe a, a six or seven year old. Um, and so the, the idea for me, by the time I was reading the Quincy, he was, I mean, this was, he was almost, um, he was already old. He was, you know, in, in his late seventies, um, and he was a writer that you sort of 
knew about, right? Especially if you had gone to school in Nigeria. Um, but then I reread um, People of the City actually around the time, um, you know, A. Igoni um, Barrett's um, book called Black Ass came out. Um, and that's a book I actually omitted to mention in, in my introduction, but I was thinking about Lagos novels at the time I read um, um, A. Igoni Barrett. And I actually found that there was some kind of, sim there was a phrase that in a sense reverberated um, or, uh, you know, in, 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 in Barrett's book, which was, you know, she, something about like dying from laughter, right? This phrase that you just, you know, you're so happy that you could die from happiness. Mm -hmm. um, that's a phrase in People of the City. And that's a phrase that was repeated in, 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 at some point in, in Black Ass. And I just felt, oh, this is, I mean, it's certainly different styles, but there is some conversation between uh, Quincy um, and anyone who has sort of written about Lagos, which was mm -hmm. um, the point I then, um, uh, what, what I started thinking about. So yeah, so that's been my, you know, my relationship to, uh, to uh, Quincy beginning from, you know, trying to plagiarize him to then rereading uh, People of the City in the light of other um, mm -hmm. Lagos novels. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about how Lagos appears in the book. I mean, it's, it's, it's a site of temptation. I mean, that's part, I mean, and it's a temptation yeah. for both, uh, you know, I mean, Sango's always worrying his mother will hear about how he's, how, all the things he's up to. Uh, but there's yeah. an interesting sympathy too with, it's, it's, it's presented also as a place that, I mean, I think he says at some point, he's talking about one of, there are two women in the book, both of whom are called Beatrice, which is an interesting, and, um, and get called Beatrice One and Beatrice Two. Um, and uh, Beatrice One comes to a, a, a bad end. And there's a kind of thing about, but of course women from the country had to come to Lagos. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a temptation yeah. which is both destructive but irresistible in that. Um, yeah. Um, but how, how does the, does the city, I mean, you say it's sort of the, it's, is this a, was that myth, is he basically making up the myth of this real city in a way or beginning, because uh, this book comes out in 54 when there is yeah. a really city literature in, um, uh, in Nigeria, I would think. There, I didn't hear the last part you said there is. Is it really any city? It's, it's one of the first books about, uh, it's one of the first novels really that's published in, yeah. In, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, the first thing to say is actually I was thinking about some kind of timeline of um, books published in, in the 50s and Equencies um, um, is sort of earlier, you know, Equencies book came out in 54, that's People of the City, um, Two Twallers, Palm Wine, um, Drinkard, right, for which, you know, sort of, I think he's best known. Um, came out in 56, if I'm right. And then Achebe's came out in, in 1958. And I, I kind of sense that you can construct, you know, um, a, a different trajectories for Nigerian literature from either of those books, right? Um, they are and, um, totally different books. In a way. Yeah, just, you know, yeah. stylistically, thematically, and all that. Um, so that's the first thing to say. I mean, I think that the 50s was an interesting moment in, in Nigerian literature or what was then known as, um, uh, I mean, yeah, it was already called Nigeria, but it wasn't independent because it was a moment where people felt, okay, now the British has to go. I mean, the clamor had sort of begun in the 40s and by the 50s, I think in 56 also, there was um, some kind of like, um, there was a motion passed in, in the parliament that um, Nigeria should become independent. That's in the Nigerian parliament. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that certainly in, the, in, the, in, the, in Nigeria of the 50s, um, there was some kind of, I mean, especially in Lagos of the 50s, there was already some kind of cosmopolitanism, right? Um, um, you know, people were traveling, um, frequently, especially to, to, to Europe, to breathe in, um, there was already a sense that this was the nerve of, you know, um, you know, some kind of new Nigerian, um, mm. culture, like hybrid culture. I don't think any other city in Nigeria at the time 
and for I mean up to like the even up till now, there's no other Nigerian city that has the fusion of mm-hmm. um, of um, identities, of possibilities, of extremities that that Lagos has. And I I, I certainly um, I'm convinced that in Lagos of the 50s that was already the case. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that Quincy was certainly reaching for um, some kind of, as you called it, melodrama. He was pushing to um, the the farthest that he could go in sort of um, presenting this uh, the archetype of the city. Mm-hmm. Um, but I actually don't think that it was exaggerated, um, mm-hmm. I, you know, especially because he was drawing from the news of the day. Um, I think that Lagos has always had that complexity. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a city that, um, you know, um, that, that has been important to what is now Nigeria since the, um, 15th century mm-hmm. at the very least. Um, so, uh, and in the, as, as a cosmopolis, right? So mm-hmm. I don't think that there was any exaggeration, but I do think that he heightened, um, um, he, he was reaching for melodrama. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The politics are, are there throughout. The second part of the book features an election, but um, his yeah. attitude, he doesn't seem to be particularly, um, I mean, it's interesting if you contrast this to a book like, the, you know, Leap Not Child, um, yeah. which is very self-consciously nation building in its agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. This book, and indeed, actually, Tutwala's, and even in a certain sense, Achebe's, none of them are, na- they are both trying to, to paint, I mean, Tutwala's tapping, of course, into the, the, um, uh, the, you know, the legends and so on, the oral tradition and Achebe doing some of that, but also talking about the end of that, a historical novel in a way, really, Achebe's in that. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I mean, a tri- uh, trilogy, trilogy of novels, yeah, actually, yeah. like, um, yeah. I mean, but Equency basically presents the politicians as so many, I mean, as one more scam artist in a city full of scam artists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as they still are, yeah. Yeah, um, um, yeah absolutely. I think that the only moment um, where Equency gets interested in nation building um, is, you know, um, in relation to Biafra. I mean, he wrote two novels on Biafra, you know. Um, mm-hmm. I think um, I can't remember the first, but the second the second one was um, keeping the peace, um, and and this was because you know like Achebe, he was you know one of the most prominent um, intellectuals who who became um, a, a top um, civil servant of Biafra. I mean, they, it was a time when you know Quincy was in his forties, so he was one of the older men mm-hmm. who you know older experienced men. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had also had like a very prominent position in, in Nigerian broadcasting, you know, mm-hmm. before the war broke out. So he was coming to, so, to Eastern Nigeria, as it was known before the war, as a person of, as an elite, as, you know, a person of influence, as a, um, as a, a, as a popular, um, you know, civil servant, mm-hmm. um, as well as, of course, writer. And so I think that he... For him, it was very clear. Um, yeah, actually, someone just commented that the other novel is divided with stand. I think that's the other Biafra novel. Mm-hmm. Um, for him, for him, the I, I, I sense that it, the the idea of a nation couldn't be properly articulated um, um, in in fiction or in storytelling as much as it could be articulated in civil service, mm-hmm. right? Um, um, and so what you have in his books are more, uh, more of attempts to capture, you know, the, the angst of, you know, of modern life, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, even if it was in the best run nation, you would still have, have to, 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 to um, figure out, you know, um, how to, I mean, in his, in his very sometimes sexist way, how to figure out, you know, the, the relationship you have with women or vice versa, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I sense that um, whereas someone like Achebe 
was interested in in some kind of you know um, um, project you know um, of what Igbo co you know cosmology or the Igbo nation that's something that Chebe said was um, Equency was quite interested in simply what does it mean to inhabit this modern era yeah. you know to be the middle class to be the lower class um, to to um, to be a a sexualized being you mm -hmm. know in this in this era and and finally i do think that there is some um perhaps because quincy had spent a lot of time in northern nigeria mm -hmm. um and he his uh, his his notion maybe of nigeria was less um concrete as you know other Igbo intellectuals like achebe or kibo or um um, you know, or, you know, the artist Uche KK. you know, I mean, he, he seemed to have this sense that um, Nigeria is more, I mean, even though he fought for Biafra, but he, 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 he seemed to be more interested in a national project um, than, um, say, an, an evil one. And I, I just stumbled on an interview after, that he gave after the war where he simply said, yeah, the war is over, people have suffered needlessly, we need to get on get back to our lives uh -huh. um and he very quickly moved back to lagos after after the, after war. the civil war and having yeah. gone through yeah are, are the eastern greens in this book basically is that sort of igbo territory and biafra or is that uh, um or is that a kind of made up area i think so i mean it's it looks like um you know the it looks like enugu um i mean where the mines are um the coal mines, it seems to be, I mean, that's what one of the things he describes in the book, um, yeah. going to the mine to report. Yeah, but that's, that's, that would be Igbo area. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he wrote the book when he was going to London to, um, mm -hmm. to study pharmacy at, at University College on the boat. And it's, there's a way in which he's sort of summoning up all the Nigerias he knows. Um, yeah. And he's not, he, it's the plentifulness that interests him and the contradictoriness rather than resolving it. I actually find the ways in which the plot unravels here or sometimes gets pushed together there in odd ways or resolved in sort of, you know, expedient ways. Not, it's not really where the life of the book is. The life of the book is in trying to, to dream up this sort of, the reality yeah. of, this, of, this, of this Nigeria that he's leaving behind, but I think meant to go back to always too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, um, Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's not, um, there, there, there is the idea that you, you think about, you only think about home in a, um, in a determined sense when you're away. Um, and, and so I, there is certainly that happening in this book, I, I would say, you know, especially with the fact that he wrote it while he was leaving Nigeria. Um, I think that it, there was some kind of hastiness in, in, the, in, the, in the writing, um, in, the, in the plotting of the book. And perhaps it's, I mean, it's simply what he could, he could yeah. manage at the time. I mean, he seemed like an incredibly busy person. Um, and, you know, and, and he wasn't, according to him, interested in pro style or yeah. even any form of stylization. He wanted to be in his words, a writer for the masses. Um, yeah, so the, yeah. that's uh, going back to the earlier idea that there is suddenly um, a, a, a trajectory of Nigerian literature that can then proceed from that assumption that um, of popular literature. Yeah, he could write sort of wonderful sentences. And, I mean, he writes crazy sentences, but also, for example, I was writing down today Slippered feet rushed among traffic, yet none belonged to the girl he sought. Yeah. Um, or, you know, Sango was in a blue mood as he walked about the city, drifting with the aimless ones, looking but not seeing. Or here, the surf beat with violence, and the courting couples were dark clumps on the sand. I mean, it's a sort of genius in these kind of, and a sort of yeah. improvising uh, genius that, that is, is present there. Um, yeah. The writing yeah. is unsettled, yeah, that's what you could say, yeah. 
Yeah, but I mean, it, it does draw on popular tropes, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, and and, uh, and he loves hyperbole and things like that. But it it um, but there's a certain kind of nervous energy in a finding its way, and of course, the the hero is an improviser, um, mm -hmm. and so uh, albeit an improviser who's who's who keeps hitting the wrong chord as it goes along. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. Um, the um, I was thinking actually. Uh, before this, that, you know, you're, you're of course right to something like Tutuola um, coming out of, I think, a Yoruban tradition, right, of, of yeah. storytelling, yeah, um, who with, which is in some sense magical realism before there was anything remotely like it. Um, and, yeah. um, but that a book that I read in a translation from Yoruba by Soyinke, which is what called the mm. Four of the Thousand Demons um, by- Yeah, D Dio Fagon, well, yeah. Yes. That in a way, that story, which has somebody constantly dealing with de demons and temptations is, is in some ways, there's not, there is a similarity between the story of the young man come to the, for to the city and the young man, the warrior making his way through the-, the Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's a very, yeah, that's a very poignant, I mean, um, poignant um, remark um, because, Tsutsuola was also accused of plagiarizing um, Fagunwa, actually. Um, uh, Fagunwa's books, I think, the, I mean, that book came out in the 40s, I would say, late 40s. Um, so, <laughs> in Yoruba, you know, so, so there is a sense in which um, um, somehow there was some kind of, even though it was denied and all that, there's some kind of conversation happening between Fagunwa and Tsutuola. Um, I, and, and then, of course, I think that the, the idea of leaving home, right, and entering into this forest of ghosts, this, you know, bush of ghosts, like, uh, you know, Tutuola's hero did, um, and then encountering, you know, the diversity of creatures, hybrid um, beings, um, and, you know, the sheer terror of, like, you know, um, just growing up in in this torment um you know of of the bush of the forest is very similar to what then happens um you know in in this kind of city novels um and and what's more telling in my thinking is that at the end of you know when 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 Tutuola's hero gets back you know when he's finally makes his way home as a, as sort of like this grown this adult Mm -hmm. he's he's thinking of how he can return to the bush of ghosts mm -hmm. um which is you know the i guess the classic story of anyone who who hates new york mm -hmm. <laughs> hates mm -hmm. lagos but can never leave um mm -hmm. or is restless when 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 they have um a certain kind of like lull or like quiet um or ease Right. So I, I, I do, I mean, but that's certainly making, you know, that's just being the audacious critic and making all kinds of connections between these books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, uh, um, would, now all these books were published at the time, they, they basically, they were published in England really, right? And shipped back yeah. to Nigeria or did they have Nigerian publishers? Ah. Uh, well, I mean, at the time, the only sort of, you know, African publisher was also affiliated to, to, um, to England. I mean, that's like the, the Heinemann African Writers Series. Yeah, right, but right. Um, um, this, um, this wasn't, I mean, there wasn't any Nigerian publishing in the, in the sense of, I mean, there was then, of course, the Heinemann opened an office in, in Nigeria, in you know, um, but in terms of indigenous publishing, that would come later, as far as I can remember. Um, and so, of course, you know, I think that inaugurated a um, a kind of relationship that exists here today, right? Where you know we um, the, the the some of the most acclaimed books um, by Nigerian writers or by African writers in general is published outside mm -hmm. of you know, um, Nigeria. Um, so yeah, so, so. So that yeah. the situation of his writing the book on the boat to London and then sort of having to go away to come home or bring your book home, it remains in some sense a, 
In some sense, yes, um, sadly. Um, I mean, of course, things have changed significantly. There are more Nigerian um, publishers um, who are doing um, really audacious things and important, um, you know, um, important things. Um, but it's still, it's almost as if you, you know, the, the it's, it's still tilted in favor of um, the US and the UK in terms of the publishing industry. And you're more likely to be widely read in, in Nigeria mm -hmm. um, if you're published abroad mm -hmm. um, than if you were published within Nigeria. And sadly, I mean, um, I think primarily because you're, you're, I mean, I'm talking of literature now, I mean, literary text. Um, your reading public are uh, most likely going to be those who have found out that you were published abroad. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, of course, there are exceptions, but, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. some kind of general rule. Mm -hmm. Well, so, I mean, the, in this book, which it, this book is full of, of just curiosity about, I mean, we've talked about the anxiety, but it's also mm -hmm. quite lively and it's just full of a curiosity about the new city, which is growing up around. It's obviously a city, it, as you said, it's a cosmopolitan city. Um, there are, you know, there's a reference to um, tensions between Middle Eastern traders and local traders. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of a city already in a globalized world. There's a mention of people, you know, having girls who have very little education, but know everything about looking sophisticated in Western styles yeah. and late classes. I mean, I, I, there, actually, I think this book could make a wonderful movie. It would, somebody could take a free hand to it, but it would be. Yeah. <laughs> And you'd have to trim some things, but um, yeah. It, so it's full of novelties, and then and I, I think I mean I think the Nigerian after the war probably a lot of stuff just flooded in as flooded in from around the world to Nigeria. I think it was a relatively prosperous time or a time of growing yeah. prosperity. Um, and the novel itself is a novelty in this book, right? Because it's 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 a new product in a new market in some sense, and which Quincy is is trying to uh, define. That that Lagos novel goes on being a kind of. You, uh, are there some people um, people you would recommend we we read now <laughs> from who are descended? Oh yeah. From heirs? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm the 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 notion for me was the the writing about Lagos with feeling, um, and I mean, there's been there's been some significant writing, of course, you know, that's happened in the last two decades and. Um, I, you know, thinking about Sefiata's, you know, just incredible and seminal book at this point, um, Everything Good Will Come. Um, and, um, and then Teju Cole's Every Day is for the Thief, um, uh, which, I, which I think came out in, um, in 2006 or so, or seven, I'm not sure, I can't remember ex the exact year. Um, and then, of course, I've mentioned Igoni Barrett's book, A Black Ass, but actually he had written earlier um, a collection of stories called Love is Power or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, there is um, more recently, um, I think there's, there, there, there are books, there are some noir books um, or crime, crime novels by um, the writer called Tony Khan. Um, um, and um, there's Chibundu on Nuzo's Welcome to Lagos, which is actually quite, um, there's some kind of conversation happening between Equencies, this Equency novel and, and that in terms of like the episodic nature um, and just like the, the string of coincidences, um, um, if I remember correctly. Um, so those are, uh, those are some books I can think about right now. Um, and uh, Ben Okri had this book, you know, Ben Okri, who wrote um, The Farmish Road, he had this book, um, I think, called Dangerous Pursuits, um, which was also a book about Lagos, I think. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> it's become a vital, I mean, it's become a sort of, in a way, a quincy is, you were saying before that you, you're a little impatient with the notion of the these sort of founding fathers of African literature. Yeah. <laughs> he does yeah. inaugurate a, 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 a um, he, he, he identifies a problem which, which people continue to grapple with. Um, in this yes, book. absolutely. Yeah. 
absolutely. I mean, you need, you need people who would inspire form. You need people who inspire um, trajectory. And um, I, feel, I feel like, especially because these three books that I mentioned earlier, you know, Equence's book, Tutwala's and Achebe's came out in the same decade, right? It would be unfair to anoint one of them as uh -huh. any sort of, I mean, I mean, the story about Achebe is actually very incredible because he almost, that, 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 um, that novel was almost never published, actually. Um, oh, really? And he, he, yeah, and he wrote in one of his, mem in, in, um, I think in, in um, there was a country that if, if he hadn't found the manuscript, he probably wouldn't have continued being a writer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, you already see the, the sense that it's it's almost like fortuitous, right? Um, mm -hmm. And and so my my sense is, how can we think about people who inspire trajectories rather than um, um, rather than people who are originators, right? Like the mm -hmm. the founding fathers, mm -hmm. um, and that's more helpful because I can take now I can think about say fiction or the kind of fiction I want to write and think about all three novels as possible um, ins ins inspirations for, for that project. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and that's precisely what I'm interested in doing. I might not agree with, you know, say, Tutuola's like, um, you know, the, his, his, um, his easy dismissal of like his ability to actually improve on his English, you know, mm -hmm. language, you know, as, you know, just crafts. Mm -hmm. But I'm totally motivated um, by the sheer range of his imagination, what he could do with those stories. Like, it's unbelievable. And I think he, he persists in the, in the canon. Well, I don't also believe in canon, but he persists in, in, our, in, you know, in our imagination precisely because the, the, the force of his imagination eclipsed his say his inability to write in good what you would call you know standard english so he's a wonderfully poetic writer there's just you know i mean it, it is that uh, and that goes to one of the other things that um uh, quincy does is he writes he writes in the idiom that people speak in the city and i think i think i think he made he did that more and more as he went along so it's so like the yeah. later novel jaguanana um, and he has, and, and his ear there is flawless and not cliched, or at least as far as I can tell. I don't know. Yeah. If he, but yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, why don't we take some questions? So, because yeah. I think, yeah. All right, I'm back. Um, here we go. And just a reminder to everyone, if you do have any questions, there's the Q&A button here at the bottom. Just click it and you can submit a question that way. Um, so we'll get going. Uh, first question, how is Aquincy's approach to the feminine characters? You said in The People of the City, women are falling for the protagonist and he is a very sexualized being. Uh, but, how is, uh, but how does he express this in his books? Is there any deeper women characters in Aquincy's uh, books overall? <laughs> am, I, am I answering no? I think that's for um, <laughs> That's for me. Yeah, I, either um, jump in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I would say is not really of anybody, but go on with the women. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I have. I mean, that's one of the challenges I faced, or I faced with a Quincy. You know, I think he's too. Um, there is some kind of stereotype, especially in people. I mean, in people of the city, for one, there is some kind of stereotype he's working with in relation to women, um, and it's simply in relation to. Um, their their desirability and their need to be desired as well as the possibility that all um encounters between say the women and the men um has some kind of like you know sexual um cloud um over it um so i find that problematic i think that he there was some some kind of complexity in jaguar nana which you know is sometimes considered to be follow up to this book in terms of like you know um one you know like scandalizing you know scandalizing um the city even more so right um or using the idea of um the you know just pushing to the to, to the farthest they could get with um um you know scandal or the scandalous 
Um, and in that book, you know, the, the, the lead character is, um, is a sex, commercial sex worker. Um, and I think that there is some sense in which that was some um, evolution from the way he portrays women in, this, in, in People of the City. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, yeah I, I don't want to either defend or not defend him, actually, but I, I also found that problematic in the portrayal of women. And um, I implore everyone to write about women differently. <laughs> I was um, our next question, do you think there's oh, yeah. a connection between his work in radio broadcasting and his writing, uh, which it seems pretty close to storytelling, any relation to oral storytelling or even Nollywood? Oh yeah, there is certainly a relationship to Nollywood. You know, the, one of the reasons why I chose that passage was that I just watched um, a re-release, or no, a, a sequel to a very famous um, Nollywood film that came out in 92. And some people um, say, you know, in a sh um, sort of like inaugurated like this, what we now call Nollywood. I mean, it was a film called Living in Bondage. Um, and the storyline is, you know, so that I save time is very similar to what I read earlier, you know, where there is some kind of ritual, ritual murder involved. Um, or being requested, um, and a man, um, especially in the in the in the one that had the remake, um, a man refusing not to do that. Um, whereas, if you ordinarily do it, you become you know so wealthy. Um, so so yeah, I mean, I do think that there is that Equency is certainly one of the Nigerian writers who um, who came very close to um, sort of get into Nollywood before, or what is now Nollywood, before Nollywood caught up. Um, and, and I see certainly how, you know, um, yeah, his, his books could have very easily or could very easily be made, be made into what, you know, I guess mainstream Nollywood films. Um, in terms of broadcasting, I don't really know. I think, I mean, if, if it's a question of, um, I guess the kind of ear he developed, you know, for, for, um, for popular culture, perhaps this is as a result of his work in broadcasting. Um, but I, I do think that, especially in the context of leave, that's the, the movie is called Living in Bondage. There is um, certainly a conversation with Nollywood. I, I want to point out real quick before we move on with questions, the, the chat has just basically become a bibliography of everything that you guys are talking about. Um, <laughs> nice. So if you are interested- I've seen a lot of Nigerian names, yeah. <laughs> if you're interested in any of this while we're going, the chat only is up while we're doing the events, so click on it now. Um, okay, our next question. Uh, there seems to be a real departure from the style of Burning Glass, which looks like it came out the year before People of the City. Any ideas as to why Quincy made the shift in subject matter and style? I haven't read Burning Grass, I must say. Um, the only thing I know, actually, is that Burning Grass is the, is the second book in the African Writer series. I don't know why that fact is, sticks out in my head. Um, Achebe's Things Fall Apart is the first, and Burning Grass is the second. Um, yeah, so I haven't read it, so I, I really would not be able to answer that question. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe Edwin would. No, yeah, I haven't read it either. So that, that uh, I... Well, a future NYRB classic. Um, okay, our next question. <laughs> Given that a lot of contemporary African books uh, are published outside of the continent, do you think it affects the audience authors write for and how they write? Um, I think it would be very reductive to say that, actually. I think um, um, writers need the reach they can get from international publishing, and that's true of um, writers anywhere. I mean, books are considered successful in America if they are published internationally to some degree. Um, so... I don't, I think that for so long we've been having to ask, ask, you know, defend the fact that we are getting better deals outside the continent. 
Um, and that's simply because of what the market is like. I don't think that should be put on any writer. Um, I, I can't, I mean, I, I find it hard to contemplate, and I'm not saying it's not true, but I find it hard to contemplate that any writer would be necessarily trying to write in terms, it's a panda to, you know, um, say the West, right? At least not the writers who um, I've been in conversation with, right? There is, a, there is certainly, for many writers I know, um, you know, who say have been published mostly in the West, a, the question of form is even more important. Like, how can I tell the story in a way that speaks of the human con uh, condition, read large or read small? Um, um, and so I, f I feel that that's a more, I think, important way to think about this. Um, I, um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I've, I've actually stopped. I find I find that actually to some degree reductive because it it puts too much um, it it's, it makes it seem as if you know um, there is some kind of authentic authenticity that we can you know get by publishing within the continent and I don't think that exists I don't think the publishing industry has for one second been in a sense. Um, primarily local. I think it has always been some kind of um, global um, conversation, um, especially when you're talking of African literature. Yeah. Okay, um, next question. Uh, what other Nigerian city do you think will inspire the literature like Lagos? <laughs> Kano. Um, Kano. It's, it's, um, it's almost as large as Lagos, if not larger. I mean, um, no one is sure if the, no, the census numbers are right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bigger city than Lagos, but that's a, that's a story for another day. Um, uh, but Kano, Kano, I think, I think that's the city that should produce more literature um, because it's almost as important in terms of being a cultural or commercial hub as Lagos is. Um, I have a bias, of course, for Eastern Nigeria because I'm Igbo, but um, I, I, would, um, I wouldn't be tribalistic, as we say in Nigeria today. I'll, I'll save that for another day. <laughs> uh, okay, we'll make this our, we'll make this our final question. Um, you talked a little bit about it, uh, but just as Luandino, Vieira, and Pepatia are considered founders of modern-day Angola in literature, do you think Achebe, Aquincy, and Tutuola uh, could be called founders of Nigeria's modern imagination? I don't know. Um, it touches a bit on our question of fathers mm. uh, in our conversation <laughs> before this. Yeah, before the, before the reading, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if we should be looking for founders I mean, in general that's my my hunch i do think that they suddenly initiated something um just as you know say buchi emecheta or um flora wapa um equally did um a little later in the 60s um i would say actually i mean shoinka should be on on that list you know for sure um, if we are trying to make a list, I think it should be at least, um, you know, 15 percent strong at the very least. Um, you know, um, and so I think that that's, that's, if we can, in a sense, broaden the scope of who we are looking to, to be named as um, founders or fathers of a certain kind of imagination, I think what we should be looking for is uh, multiple entry points, right? Um, you know, um, and, and so that's what I'm, I'm actually quite interested in doing that, as, uh, you know, in my own thinking and in my own writing to say, if I don't have a list of 10 writers, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I shouldn't begin. Um, and I think three is a far too small number. And I think if we can expand the uh the scope of this 
um, this, you know, this timeline to say, and you know, one more decade, right? So you have more people automatically um, because Nigeria really took off. I would dare say um, the, the Nigeria really took off after the Nigerian Civil War. That's really when the project of Nigeria, um, especially um, independent Nigeria began, right? Um, because there had been a, uh, an existential threat to its um, survival as, as a concept, as an idea. And so if we could expand that list to any writer um, or many of the more prominent writers, um, well, not prominent, but many of the writers who were working in, in up till the, the 60s, you know, I think would have a far more um, helpful um, um, list. Uh, thank you guys so much for, uh, for joining us tonight. Um, and Manuel, thank you for staying up late. Yeah. Uh, this, was, this was really terrific. Edwin, as always. Yeah. Um, Thanks to everybody for listening in and to you yeah. out in the bookstore and Manuel. That, um... We'll do it again. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and just a reminder to everyone, um, we, we have copies for sale at communitybookstore.net. Um, you can find it. I posted a link in the chat, but that might be disappearing soon. So just head over to our website. Um, otherwise, you can uh, join us for future programming. We have a lot more coming up. Um, the book is People of the City, uh, this beautiful cover by NYRB Classics. Um, and otherwise, oh, there's the <laughs> don't buy that one. Don't buy the <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, uh, we'll see you all for our next event. Thank you guys so much again, everybody. Be safe. Thank you. Healthy. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Good night.